You are listening to the Cycling Podcast at the Tour de France, in association with Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Today, we are in Station des Rousses. Where are we, Lionel? We're at Station des Rousses in the Jura at the finish of stage eight of the Tour de France. And they are around, what's that, 12 kilometers to go? 13.4. My eyesight is getting worse. Maybe if I take my sunglasses off. Yes, I can see the screen better now. Lillian Kalmejan of Direct Energy is currently the leader on his own. He's being chased by Warren Barguil, his second on the road, Team Sunweb. What else has happened today? Well, Richard, if I did a tale of the attack now, that would basically be the episode done and dusted. It would take me 40 minutes to sum up what has happened today. It's been an anarchic day, a punk rock day on the Tour de France. A group of around 50 riders and a lot of big names um, in that group got away when the race split up quite early on. Um, well, who was in there? <laughs> Do you want me to run through all 50 names? Everybody. Uh, I mean, everybody was a chance of winning the stage, I guess, was there. You had the Van Avermaets, you had the, the Warren Bargillis, you had the Ro- Ro- Robert Hessing, you had the, you, you even had a couple of uh, uh, of Team Sky guys a bit lost there, you know, like Christian Knest, who later w- uh, went back. You had, uh, I think everybody was a chance. The, the only one missing, probably, with a chance to win the stage and uh, take a, a advantage from the break, the only one missing was probably Peter Sagan. <laughs> All the others were there, 50 guys, all of them great names. Even Sylvain Chavanel, who won the stage here seven years ago, was in that group in the first place. So, yeah, uh, well, think, have a look at the GC, you know, look, look at the guys who are, you know, great riders with a chance to win the stage without being a problem for Team Sky overall, and you have the composition of the group. Well, when they got to the bottom of this final climb, it, it levels out at the top here, so they're not finishing um, right on the top of anything. They've, they've got a slog to go at the top of the climb. And the eight riders that reached the bottom in the lead, Francois, some of the names you mentioned, uh, Warren Barguil, Jan Bacalance, Kalmajan, Nicholas Roach of BMC, Robert Hessing, Greg Van Avermaet, Simon Clark and Serge Powell's really powerful um, riders but it's been an, a fascinating intriguing all those cliches kind of day hasn't it because Team Sky had Mikel Lander in that split first of all but then thought better of letting Lander gain what might have been a couple of minutes three minutes whatever they sent Christian Knees back to so that Sky could keep everything under control they clearly don't want it to be um, you know a, a real kind of shake up of anything today do they? Well, that 50-man group split up fairly early on and a, a, a strong core of about 16 riders formed at the front. Then Warren Barguil attacked with about 80 kilometres, 85, actually close to 90 kilometres still to go. Took Serge Powell's with him. I thought, I wondered if he was going for the King he of the Mountains. For, I'm, I'm pretty convinced he's going for the pocket of Jersey because he's only a, a few points short of it now. So uh, obviously it was his ambition, probably at the beginning of the tour, knowing he was not going for GC, like Pierre Roland, like Thibaut Pinot. These guys are going to go for the stage win and the, the pocket of Jersey. Well, the race is kind of back under control, really. It has been for probably 20 or 30 kilometres. It settled into more of a familiar rhythm. But for the first half of the stage, Rich, we were really urging on the 50 men at the front to cause chaos. And maybe we could see uh, a complete kind of explosion here at the Tour de France, put Team Sky on the back foot and make them think about how they're going to race a stage like this, which has got kind of hidden danger in it. Well, just occasionally you get a, a, a move like that on a stage like this that gets maybe 10 minutes. We saw it at the Giro in 2010, which a group, a big group that contains some riders who were real rank outsiders for the Tour. You could say the same thing happened in 2006 at the Tour with Oscar Pereiro, who was sort of allowed uh, to build a big leap, got in the yellow jersey and looked like he might end up winning the Tour. And Oscar Pereiro, type rider, there were a few of them in that, in that group really, but... Sky did panic a little bit, not panic, but they certainly were running fairly hard to keep it within four minutes. I was quite surprised if a bit of left field thinking would have been to give uh, Mikel Landa his head because of all the riders in that front group, of all of them, the one rider who you could imagine winning a Grand Tour, frankly, 
minutes would be Mikel Landa. Imagine if they'd allowed the group to get five, six, seven minutes. It would have forced BMC and the other teams to change. AG2R, though, also were in a very good position. They had Pierre Latour up there, as well as Jan Bacalans, and I think they had another rider up there as well. Um, so, you know, interesting. And uh, I, Sky, obviously, all their oofs are in one basket and that is Chris Fruit. It's all about Chris Froome, isn't it? But land up, maybe there are doubts about how he's going. Interestingly, um, we spoke the other day at La Planche de Belfi about some of the inverted commas disappointing uh, performances by the likes of Sergio Hina and Mikel Landa on that climb. I spoke to Javier Artecha, the Team Sky coach, a couple of days later. He, he, he said how the, the, the really small riders find that adjustment from the flat stages to the hilly stages extremely difficult because they have suffered so much on the flat stages they finish the flat stages more fatigued more stressed than the slightly bigger riders so it takes them a bit longer to get into the, the climbing rhythm uh, and he su suspected we'd see far more of them in the next week or so but of course Landa has ridden the Giro and may still be tired from that well Rich I've just got to correct myself because Lillian Kalmajan is the man out in front he's being chased by Robert Hessink I think I said Warren Barguil at the start getting a little carried away there um, and then there's a, a group which has certainly got Nicholas Roach and I think Barguil's in that group there um, another couple of hundred metres behind but Kalmajan we first really saw him come to uh, prominence at this sort of level at the Vuelta a España last summer didn't we when he won the first mountain stage in not dissimilar circumstances to this coming out of a big break and then uh, pressing home an advantage on the final climb an impressive rider um, a Frenchman with direct energy in the team uh, alongside Thomas Vauclair the controversy before the tour was that they left their sprinter Brian Cocard out of the race because we believe Cocard is leaving the team at the end of the season um, but Calmajan Francois can you tell us anything about him? Yeah, well, he's, he's a very young and promising rider. He's, he was on his first pro year, la, la, uh, pro year last year, and he's, in his first Grand Tour, he won a stage, as you said, in La Vuelta. Uh, and, and he was exactly in the same sort of, uh, you know, ex exciting, uh, kind of uh, a little bit messy uh, stage with, with a long break, and then he, he got away from it. Uh, and and he's, he's, he's what we call him baroudeur in French, you know, this kind of guy who attacks, knows to, how to make the best of a, of a breakaway. And he's, he's also a, you know, where the, 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 in his last few days we mentioned all, all the, the bright, uh, young, up and coming generation. He's a guy with, uh, with uh, university degrees. He studied in England, actually, I think in Manchester. Nottingham, and, I think. Nottingham. Well, you're right, it's Nottingham. Very, absolutely, I should have known that. Um, and yeah, so, so, so a very interesting character. You young guy from Albi uh, near Toulouse and um, a very very promising uh, young rider and he's actually the leader uh, he's, he's actually the, the, the direct energy real team leader more than Tommy Vockler or anybody else because I mean I think Jean-René Bernardo the team manager and founder has, has, a, has a real trust in, the, in this uh, young rider obviously he, he was not uh, in, entirely wrong coming back to what we saw this morning I think that the problem was the mess came probably from you had so many riders who want to be in the break today because they know the break will go all the way. That, that's why all of a sudden you have 50 guys there. It caused a little bit of excitement and Team Sky, at, you know, for, for what? Maybe uh, an hour we're, we're struggling, but now actually we're, we're back in a, in a very classic situation in, in, in a mountain stage with, with a break, we made it all the way, uh, guys going for a stage win and, and behind that uh, Team Sky leading the way with all the other uh, leaders, you know, waiting calmly for the, for, the, for the last climb. But at least for once we thought, you know, Team Sky are forced to do what they do best, which is uh, defending the yellow jersey. So an exciting final ahead. OK, Rich, well, now there's 8.4 kilometres for Lillian Kalmajan to go to the finish. Um, a bit of a near miss there, just as we were talking before, the Bahrain Merida team bus came over the line, cutting it very fine getting onto the course, but it's been a hell of a transfer for the team vehicles from the start this morning um, to uh, uh, Station de Rousse here. It was also roasting hot this morning, wasn't it? So Kalmajan would have probably liked that, being from Albi. A little bit cooler up here. Um, you know me, I hate speculation, but I'm going to put you two on the spot. Will Kalmajan hang on for the stage win, or is Robert Hessink going to catch him? Or what? Or what? I think Kalmajan uh, has got a very good chance of holding on. I mean, Hessink is closing fast, but my sense is that Kalmajan looks good, and, you know, he's not got much more to climb before we, we reach the plateau, I think. So he looks good. He's a very, as you say, a baradar. He's a very strong rider, isn't he? It must be all these time trials in the Nottingham area. 
Well, if last year's Vuelta is a lesson, uh, well, Kalmajan proved he could do it, and Hessing, you know, almost made it in the same Vuelta last year and, and missed out by very little. So maybe the same scenario again, Hessing missing by very little and Kalmajan winning? Well, we'll see, and then we'll go and talk to some people after the finish, and then uh, we'll, we'll carry on with the cycling podcast. Oh, ouch, ouch, ouch. We may have spoken too soon. Well, Francois has gone running off to the direct energy bus. To catch the celebration. To think, yeah, thinking that that's the story of the day. And, and with just under five kilometres to go, Lillian Kalmajan has had a nasty attack of the cramp. Don't want to speculate, but that really does look like what it is. And uh, it, Well, we've all been there, haven't we? I mean, it's game over. He just, he, he just almost came to a halt. He's, he's suffered cramp in his left thigh by the looks of things and yeah possibly a casualty of a long hot right of long, right thigh couple of long hot days um, very hard to stay hydrated isn't it when it's when it's this warm and so he seems well he's, he's gone to a much lighter gear now and he's pedaling much more smoothly but he's probably lost a fair bit of speed there trying to stretch out his leg and ease the pain and that gives uh, I'd say that's now advantage Hessink I don't know if he listens to our science and sport features on the cycling podcast, but, you know, I think uh, he's... Uh, listen, it's been a very, very hard day, as you say, a very hot day after a few hot days. Uh, it's, I always find it surprising how how rarely we see riders suffer from cramp like that because any any of us amateur riders will know exactly what Kalmajan has just been through there. But it just shows you how quickly it changes on a, a finish like this all of a sudden that yellow jersey group at 1 minute 18 not out of the question is it with 4 kilometres and a bit to go um, but Richard as you said when we were driving down you were keeping an eye on the, uh, what was happening in the race watching it on uh, the Eurosport player while I was driving it was an absolutely hell for leather start to the stage and when I say start to the stage really the first three quarters of it were ridden at a real high intensity um, fast, difficult terrain and it's not a surprise that these guys are paying the price a bit at the tail end of the day Arno Damar, we did mention him earlier but he's been off the back all day long way down, few, few, few riders could be in uh, danger of being eliminated today and we mentioned didn't we that I don't know if that's actually the case but it, if it is sometimes there's a bit of leniency shown but the UCI uh, commissars having thrown out Peter Sagan uh, with a very well strict interpretation of the rules would be under a lot of pressure I think to stick to the rules on this occasion if that proves to be the case we shall see but uh, Kalmajan looks like he's recovered a little bit which as any of us know who've had cramp you, you know if you manage to stretch the muscle you can you can recover a little bit yeah I mean uh, I'm finding it quite confusing because you've got a guy in black with flashes of yellow on his kit being chased by a guy in black with flashes of yellow on his kit direct energy and uh, uh, team lotto NL Yumbo's kit from a certain angle is uh, very similar isn't it mm. <laughs> An extraordinary victory today for uh, Direct Energy. I mean, Lilian, the great hope of, of the team on the day of Jean, Jean René Bernardo's birthday. Yes, we were all sure that he was able to do this. He did it last year on the Vuelta for his first professional season. We were convinced he, he, he was uh, able to do it again. But today, uh, on the Tour de France, on the birthday, uh, at the birthday uh, of Jean René, it's uh, it's a fantastic story, a fantastic uh, sports story. For many of us, T Thomas Vauclair was still, in, in a way, the, 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 maybe the most favourite rider in the, the, the Direct Energy team. But then Lilian is really the new generation, it's the up-and-coming generation of the team. Yes, of course. Uh, uh, Thomas Vauclair is a... a uh, an example for, for Lilian. Uh, he has learned a lot with him and uh, uh, I don't know if you saw when uh, at the end of the, in the finish, uh, he, uh, <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, a, he stuck his tongue out. Exactly, like. he stuck his tongue, like Thomas, it, it was a, a kind of a tribute to him and it's great to, to we are sure now that we have found uh, his successor. What kind of a guy is he, uh, Lilian? Well, he's a, a, a quite normal, uh, young, uh, 24 uh, boy, uh, but he's very, very uh, professional. Uh, he's uh, uh, very determined, and uh, but uh, uh, always smiley. He's a great, great guy. 
So for you, the tour is already a huge success. There was doubt before the start of the tour because of Brian couldn't make it. And uh, well, actually, you, you were proved right. Yes, to be honest, uh, uh, one stage victory was our uh, main goal. This one uh, uh, here in Les Rousses, uh, it's fantastic. Here we go at 5.34 p.m. An enthusiastic round of applause for the last man on the road, Uri Sagan. He's going pretty well, he looks very pale. It's been a long, hot day for him. Followed by the Bora Hansgrohe team car and the Voiture Ballet, the broom wagon. He's made it inside the time cut pretty comfortably in the end. But he might get to the finish and wish that perhaps he hadn't. No, that's not fair. He's obviously going to fight another day. But tomorrow is another very hard one. Well, it's just gone half past five in the afternoon. And I've walked a little bit down the road. I'm standing with around 350 metres to go to the finish line. And I've just seen the group of Arnaud Demar, the French champion, come in. Demar's not been too well, um, but he's well inside the time cut. Um, yeah, the Gruppetto came in at 31 minutes after the stage winner Lilian Kalmajan, and that was six minutes ago. So by my reckoning, it's 37 minutes and counting. And we know that Uri Sagan, the brother of Peter Sagan, of course, is the last rider on the road. Not entirely sure if there's anyone between the Demar group and Sagan, but Sagan will be in front of the broom wagon, which literally sweeps up the last rider on the road. And it's been an incredibly tough day here. The podium presentations have all taken place. Chris Froome will be doing his interview um, and then we'll be away to the team hotel. The Tour de France is beginning to pack up and yet Uri Sagan's day is not over. The crowd's thinned out as well, of course. People have headed away, back down the mountain. I mean, there are people who've waited to see the last man on the road and I think he's got around about 11 or 12 minutes to get inside the time cut. And in fact, there are some riders on the road wearing big yellow wigs. They shouldn't really be on the course while the race is still in progress. But I shall wait and see if Sagan makes it. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much to Science and Sport for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast. A reminder, you can all get 20% off your Science and Sport products at scienceandsport.com. Enter the code CPOD20. That's CPOD20. So here we are in the, in the quiet of the press room. Very tranquil here, isn't it? Cool and tranquil after the madness of the stage. It is the calm after the storm, isn't it? Although the storm never, ma never materialised. No, uh, never. I remember <laughs> seven years ago we were in the same place. There was a hailstorm and it was drumming on the on, on the on the press room. It was terrible. Got me off a potential uh, uh, potential trouble from two organisers that day because I'd been I'd been stopped for driving a little bit too fast through a town by a, a gendarme. I was then spotted by an ASO official. I was told to go and report to the ASO here at the press centre at the finish. Mm. But then there was this apocalyptic storm. Hypothermic spectators yes. were, were brought in here. And in all the... Kids uh, in, in flip-flops. Yeah. It was, it was yeah. really terrible. And in all the madness, my, my misdemeanour was, was forgotten. So I'd <laughs> and you learned your, you learned your lesson from that. It was divine intervention. And you, uh, you and drive very moderately now. Since then, I've driven very carefully mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. Tour de France. Mm -hmm. But they have been forecasting storms. <laughs> l l warning of orage on all of the auto route uh, yes. signs today. But nothing materialised. No. Uh, they, they do the same for tomorrow a bit. But uh, hopefully it will hold. And uh, the storm was in the race, actually. Francois was hoping it. for bad weather so he can wear his new, <laughs> his new Rafa cycling Absolutely. podcast jacket. He's so brilliant <laughs> and beautiful. <laughs> Listen, but we you're right. talk about the stage. We, we, were, we did hear there from you, Lionel, you were waiting for uh, Uri I, Yeah, Sagan. I watched, watched the last man come in over the line. It just struck me, the, the loneliness of it. I mean, a day like that where they've, they've absolutely bashed each other's heads in. And it, it always amazes me, you know, 
who's making it this hard? Because it's never just one person. There are several people collaborating to make it this hard. Trying to get in the break. Exactly. Exactly. And I mean, that must have been for anyone suffering. Arno Demar was in the group yeah. just ahead. He's been a, a little bit unwell. Um, and for Uri Sagan, who who I don't know whether he's really uh, at this level. Um, they uh, they had a very very hard day. Which is after that we heard uh, a little yeah, bit of reaction from Direct Energy yeah. and Martin Bertrand. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We heard him talk a little bit Carmejan as a potential successor to to Tommy Vokler. But as you say, Lionel, it was a day when riders were, were bashing each other's heads, and it was a it was a nervous, tense day for Team Sky. Their sports director Nicolas Portal put it at eight and a half or nine out of ten in terms of, of stress levels. I spoke to him at the finish. Here's what he had to say. A hard day then. Really hard, yeah. Really tough, hard, tense, and finally we uh, we end up with a good situation. But uh, that was uh, clearly much much more hard than expected. We always can say, oh, that could be a stage like this, but we didn't really believe at that. Anyway, we have a plan to, in case you know, to everything is happening. So if it happened like this. But that was, uh, that was really hard, yeah. Was there anybody that worried you particularly in that front group? Um, yes, at the beginning, uh, Pierre Latour. Uh, I think he's a really good talent. And, um, you know, in theory, he's, uh, he's a really good bike rider and he's going to be one of the future top guys. You don't want to really put him back into the game, you know, when you get some time. I think it's one minute, he was one minute on GC or something like that. So, like, woof, you know... Uh, that was, a, that was a proper GC guys and then a few guys at two minutes one minute so this is the, the different but he is one of the top uh. and I guess with a group that size there's a danger isn't there that, that it, the lead goes out to five, six, seven minutes well yeah um, the thing is uh, when you got numbers in the front uh, like this and especially when you got the top guys in the front like uh, Pierre Latour in general there's not working really well because they say hey people are in the front and say he's obviously is a uh, if I'm with Pierre Latour, I have less chance to win the stage because the bunch is going to bring him back, or Sky, or another team. So they don't want to work with him, and that make you know that we, we saw today. Uh, it's been like uh, from the, this original 50 guys, it's been like different kind of break and attacking. So everybody's nervous. So for us, when we see that, okay, we say, oh, we say, okay, we ride our pace, we keep three, three, two, three minutes, and uh, that's it. We don't even try to bring it back. We can, if not, we're going to kill ourselves. Mm-hmm. What about Mikel Land? I mean, he was there as well. He's uh, an outsider on, on GC. He's obviously not your leader, but was there a temptation to maybe allow the group to, to form with him in it and p- perhaps force some of the other teams to, to chase to bring him back? Yeah, I mean, this is a part of a strategy also. No? We try to uh, keep some of the guys up on GC. So the kind of stage like this is, can be really, really clever for us. And today it didn't work because nobody really wants to chase behind. But let's say, imagine if the same day tomorrow, that could be a much more advantage for sure. But uh, and you know you got um, Kirsten Knies, Landa, and Sergio now in the front. Obviously they're, they've been riding the same pace than us, so it doesn't mean doesn't change anything. And if you need them, like we need uh, we need uh, Knizi, we ask him to drop, and that was perfect. So that was pretty smart to do it. Yeah. And chapeau to them because they've been really really on top of, of the game. I think the thing is, Rich, when you look at the uh, the result of the stage and the general classification very very little has changed overall certainly nothing has changed overall at the top end and yet this was a really really tough day and it will be one that will have an almost invisible impact on how the rest of the race goes because there will be very tired riders there'll be dehydrated riders there'll be there'll be a lot of people trying to recover remember tomorrow's stage is an absolute brute i know it doesn't finish up a mountain it finishes down in chambery but it goes over some really difficult climbs the mont de chat is exceptionally difficult and as Chris Froome said in the press conference afterwards, people will pay the price mm. tomorrow for the the brutality almost of today. And we, I, I don't use that word lightly because, as we said when we were uh, watching the the finale of the race, you know, it was a real headbangers day. Um, and in fact, Orla sent you a text. Orla Chenui sent you a text, which I thought was really... It was a tweet, actually. It was a, oh, well, okay. She, um, she tweeted. Um, and it, I thought that was really perceptive because it I was... I should have wasted it. It was very perceptive. I don't think she wa- have wasted it in a text to me. She, she, you know, she put it out to the internet. So wasted it on the internet. <laughs> but she basically said that it was it was like watching a load of people who don't really know how to race bikes. And, and I, it doesn't mean that disrespectful 
disrespectfully, but it was almost like uh, sort of junior or, or like fourth cat rider, or like a one day race where the you know the sense that there's no there's going to be no consequences to the aggression, and of course there will be consequences to the aggression. It's not a rest day tomorrow. The rest day is on Monday. I know that the middle week is relatively calm um you know it's not savage everything will build towards the the, the stage to uh, the col d'isoir but tomorrow is a, a day where i suspect we will see some people pay the price and the gc may blow open now what do you reckon francois i talked to yvon madur the uh, fdg team director is always uh, you know his, his view on the on the race is always very very right and you know he's a kind of so, you know soft spoken person but he he really thinks th- sees things uh, as they go and it, and he told me exactly what he said he said this stage is going to to, to cause a lot of damage uh, it, much more than La Planche de Belfi much more than you know, yesterday he said probably much more than tomorrow so he said tomorrow is re- re- relatively clear he was talking again because of course Arnaud Dema is in his team and he was saying the sprinters tomorrow it'll be much simpler for them because the Gruppetto is going to form early on they're going to pace themselves it's going to be a good day so they were he was optimistic for Dema quickly about Dema you were talking about Sagan finishing last he, uh, well, after you know crossing the line Demar paid tribute to the two guys who stayed with him uh, and took him to the finale and, and there was Mikhail Delage and um, Inertas Konovalovas and he said these two guys the way they rode today it was not work it was love you know it's, it shows what, what a dedication you know the, the race at every level from the top of course with Lilian Kalmejan inside the GC battle it, and, and at the back Today was 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 a really a dreadful day for lots of guys, and the, really, I'm sure the bodies will suffer uh, very much. So quickly about the uh, team Sky and 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 the tactics, we saw them kind of panic a little bit, and and once again we saw at La Planche de Belfi, Fabio Aru showed the way to beat Team Sky in the final climb today. Uh, maybe the, this, this this struggle to get into the break sh- showed another way maybe to unsettle uh, Team Sky. Maybe chaos is the is the option. You know, they, 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 it's an orderly team. They like things to be done properly. So create anarchy and maybe you have a chance to beat Team Sky. Well, earlier on, uh, right at the start of the episode, I described it as an anarchic, almost punk rock type Tour de France stage, and I. I said in the car on the way here that Team Sky are the cold play of uh, if, if you were to uh, compare them in, in the world of music and you're absolutely right Francois they want it to be ordered they want it to be uh, relatively predictable and yet they and had cold play is most famous song Yellow. Uh, that's right. Oh, there we go. They're, they're only good song, to be honest. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but the, and it, team it, leader is Chris as well. With, with a, <laughs> without, without, being, uh, without being unkind about either Chris Froome or Sky or Coldplay, because well, we'll, we'll, we'll no doubt there'll be loads of Coldplay. I'll get deluges of tweets from Coldplay fans <laughs> saying how unfair I'm being. Um, but, you know, it's kind of music by numbers, isn't it? And Team Sky do race by, by numbers. And, and so when they had Mikel Lander... Sergio Enal, Christian Caniz up the road, you thought this is almost Movistar-like um, racing here. And Richard, you've been saying all day, why didn't they encourage Lander to go on and, and well, see why didn't what... They just, why didn't they give other teams the impression that they weren't going to chase Lander? That's the thing. They, they, they put Lander in this move and then chased it. So other teams were mm. reassured that they weren't going to send Lander up the road as a sort decoy yeah. but a very dangerous decoy had they sat back allowed the, the gap to grow I, I asked Portal about this of course he said that the guy that they fear is Pierre Latour mm-hmm. which suggests that they put Pierre Latour on a higher level than Mikel Landa mm. but much yeah much more clever would have been to to, to, to ask Landa to go for the stage win the, the other teams would have had to chase behind Landa they, they, they've had the yellow jersey for, for, for since the start you know put Landa in a position to win the stage Put it, put him in in, in in the in the in the finish break. You don't, you know, you don't have to do the work because you know uh, you've got a guy in a good position. But the the, the crazy thing is, you have this uh, chaos at the start. That these 50 guys in the front, three Team Sky, yeah, three Team Sky, uh, and then you call them back. 
as you say, it, well, you, you are very unfair to Movistar. I don't think they're. Uh, I think no, no, no. I'm saying Movistar would put riders yeah, up on the road right. in that, that, that way. That's, that, yeah, Movistar yeah. always do that. Yeah. They, as uh, Jose Luis Arrieta says very often, I talked to him two days ago. That that's their tactics. They send a man in the front. If you know that there's no danger, the guy can you know play his own card and go for the stage win. And if somebody is in trouble at the back, he stops. Acts as you know, acts as a relay kind of you know, a pivotal role to to relaunch uh, the the leader, and that, that's the tactic they they, they use usually. But uh, Timska didn't do that. They just they, you they had, you had the impression they put that themselves on the back foot instead of having they could have had Landa, Kniez, and Henao driving it at the front. Instead, they had Kwiatkowski and Nievi driving it behind. And they would have had a real hard day because Kwiatkowski in particular was working incredibly hard for a long uh, period of time. And, um, you know, they've used up a lot of energy there. And, it, you know, there's still a lot of racing to do. And the thing about it is it won't necessarily be the formulaic racing where, um, you know, it's nice and safe. And, uh, and I'm not saying it's easy, but if it's unpredictable, then you know the mental stress is reduced and they can calculate right well this guy can do 20 kilometers on the front this guy can do 20 kilometers on the front and so on and so on when it's like today it's it's so unpredictable that they're probably not sure until they get to the end exactly where mm. where they are in terms of how much they've wasted um whether it was worth it you know what they they gained nothing they didn't lose anything of course but they in in standing exactly where they were this morning they've used up a lot of energy yeah. And mentally, I think La Planche de Belfi with Arrow and today uh, gave ideas to, to teams. Like, like, you know, there's no Team Sky complex anymore, uh, which, I mean, for tomorrow, it could be very important because the profile of, of, of those stages, the profile of, of a stage where you can attack from afar, normally m most teams would have been shy, wait, waiting to see what happens, waiting for Team Sky to, to, to do the job. Maybe tomorrow there, there'll be more than, than attempts to break uh, and go for the stage, like, well, Ivo Maggio told me Thibaut Pino would at, l at last, you know, uh, you know, get away from his hiding position to try and tackle the stage and go for a stage win. But I, I don't think there'll be only a break for go to go for a stage win. I think and I hope that some of the GC leaders will, will having seen what happened today and having seen our uh, Team Sky can sometimes be put out of balance a little bit, may, may try something a little bit earlier on than just Le Mans du Chat. Well, yeah, we saw right near the finish Daniel Martin of Quickstep, who is lying fourth overall, 25 seconds back. He made that little move, didn't he? As riders were um, being caught up from the original break, um, giving him something to chase. He made that move out of the, the GC group. He said afterwards uh, on uh, the finish line that you know, he used a TV motorbike to give himself a little bit of extra shelter. Hey, why not? And um, uh, when he was asked, well, you know, why, why were you making that move? He said, well, you just never know. He could have stolen a few seconds there. Um, and, and I think that keys into what you're saying, Francois, the, the, the shield of invincibility around Team Sky. I mean, they're still very formidable, but maybe they're not, you know, they're not unbreachable. Well, not everybody hated today. Some enjoyed it. The climbers, like Louis Menkes, the South African rider, he was 12th on the stage. Um, just, I, w I spoke to him about a point I made in part one about the, the climbers and how they struggle on the flat stages. I thought what he said was quite interesting. Here is Louis Menkes. For me, it was a nice stage. <laughs> All the big sprinters have been making me suffer the last few days, and today I could see them suffer. So, <laughs> yeah, I know it was uh, really hard. Um, it was pretty clear that uh, the breakaway is going to win the day, so uh, it was a real fight for, for the break to get away. But, yeah, and uh, I think most of the GC guys just kind of tried to ride a little bit conservatively to save for tomorrow. We, we often talk about how hard these mountain stages are for the sprinters, but can you describe how hard the, the flat stages are for, for the climbers, guys like you? <laughs> yeah, well, you can just think about it. Um, all the all the sprinters are if they riding on a flat stage they maybe only have to average 2.5 watts per kilogram where i'm having to do three or th above that all day so yeah i'm just always closer to my limit and uh yeah you you actually really have to to take care just to stay in the bunch sometimes hey i'm anas i'm the assistant manager in the rafa clubhouse in copenhagen and you're listening to the Cycling Podcast in association with Rafa. The Rafa Cycling Club is the largest global community of its kind. 
Members share their passion for the road through rides, events, exclusive club kits and racing. Find out more at rafa.cc. Thank you very much indeed to Rafa for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast. And as part of our partnership with Rafa, we have been supplied with some lovely Peddler de Charme t-shirts. We ran a poll a couple of days ago to find our first Peddler de Charme of the 2017 Tour de France. I went at the finish today to give it to Taylor Finney. Not his sort of stage today, but he was in uh, in Taylor Finney form. Uh, here's what he said on receiving his Peddler de Charme t-shirt. Taylor, our first Peddler de Charme of the Tour de France. A, a huge moment for you. One of the only times I think in my life I've ever been speechless. Oh, that's not great for an interview. No. How was today? It was quite hard. It was a lot harder than expected. But uh, winning an award at the end of the day is a, is a huge honour. You've got a t-shirt now to give you strength through the rest of the tour. Yeah, thank you. Thanks to everybody who voted. So that was Taylor Finney. Uh, very, very Taylor Finney interview that. Quite brief, uh, quite short. He, uh, he did a throwaway comment. Where he he'd, he'd spotted the poll. I don't know if he voted for himself, but um, I said, you know, congratulations, you you won Pedro de Charme. He said, yeah, but I saw who I was up against. <laughs> oh, that's a bit hard. He's up against everybody. The, the, the is, final four, the final the four, final four were course. the people who were nominated, mm. all for very good reasons. But uh, <laughs> yeah, well, on the Pedro de Charme, I finally got my hands on my own Pedro de Charme cycling jersey. I went out for a ride this morning on it. Um, I'm it's, I'm a I feel a Wow. I, I'm not sure whether my pedalling style is terribly charming. Um, I remember many years ago going for a ride with Daniel Freib, our, our friend and colleague, and oh, we're missing him, aren't we? We'll hear from him. In fact, well, let's today. hear from him now, shall we? Well, can I say what he said about my uh, pedalling okay, style? Okay, right. He, he likened me to Bert Grabsch, the... Uh, Ooh. Oh, was that you, was that it? That was me. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> well, he'd actually witnessed my pedaling style. He likened me to Bert Grabsch, the former German world time trial champion, um, famous for pedaling enormous gears. Um, I don't really pedal enormous gears, but what I do do is I make pedaling small gears look like I'm pedaling big gears. <laughs> Bonsoir, good evening chaps. Long time no see, long time no speak. That, that's actually not strictly true. I have glimpsed you a couple of times. Glimpsed Napalm strutting by, looks in fine form. I know he's been out on his bike in the mornings. Boy does it show, boy does it show. He looks in fine fettle. Um, Rich, you've also been hobbling around the start village. Um, I know your hip has been giving you jip. Uh, an intentional rhyme there. But anyway, chaps, anyway, we're not here to talk about you. We're here to talk about me and only me because I'm feeling very pleased with myself today after my fabulous prediction in on the pages of Pro Cycling Magazine a couple of months ago that Lillian Calmejean would win this particular stage, the Station des Russes. And I'm going to milk it. I'm going to milk this for all it's worth. Um, you thought that the, the Justin Rose story was a broken record. Well, you, you ain't heard nothing yet. Um, on a serious note, Calmejean, I think, has really come of age today and we have seen the emergence of a bit of a star I don't know exactly how he's going to develop and what he's going to become in professional cycling and um, he's someone who can do pretty much everything relatively well at the moment and um, very strong boy could could develop into a general classification rider um, certainly on the evidence of a couple of his performances this week but that is going to be well, a few years down the line I think Beyond that, chaps, I'm looking forward to tomorrow's stage. Um, for my money, one of the hardest mountain stages, and certainly in terms of the steepness of the gradients that we've seen in recent years of the Tour de France. Actually been compiling a bit of a list, a bit of a ranking of the hardest climbs ever to be tackled by the Tour de France. And the Mont du Chat is definitely up there, but so is the Col de la Biche, um, which comes earlier on tomorrow's stage. It's amazing when you actually compare the hardest Tour de France climbs um, ever tackled to the hardest climbs in the Giro and the Vuelta. They're, they're very tame, the tour climbs by comparison. But the Mont du Chai is certainly up there. Um, I went over at the Dauphiné in June, and um, I actually think that it's slightly more benign than its statistics suggest. Um, the best guide I felt on the day was just watching the how much the amateur riders that were trying to climb it were struggling and, and puffing and panting. Um, but it's a deceptive one. It, it, it doesn't look quite as, as tough as, as that average grading of over 10% suggests. But yeah, I think we're going to see a big sort out. I think um, Richie Port really needs to make hay while the sun shines because I think Sky might 
have the suspicion that Port is just teetering over his form peak and that he might struggle slightly in the third week. So um, he really needs to cash in now. And um, and I think Sky have got a couple of guys who are going to go much better in the third week but might be a bit undercooked at the moment. So guys like Mikel Lander and Sergio Henao who did not do that much racing in June or if any racing so um, I think um, BMC really needs to be aggressive tomorrow but we'll we'll see what happens in the meantime I'm off to Nantois not the prettiest most salubrious town in France but you know a nice lakeside location nonetheless so I'm off there now chaps and hopefully gonna catch up with you tomorrow morning I'll see you skulking around the village I'm gonna make it my mission now, and I also want to see this water challenge that Francois did because I it defies belief it's like some of the performances we saw at the Tour de France in the 1990s, pas normal. But then I suppose the same could be said for my prognostication abilities. Anyway, bonsoir. I'm sorry, Daniel, that you don't believe in miracles. <laughs> I'm sorry you don't believe in miracles. It was all miracle water. What a cynic, eh? Wow. Well, no, there's no miracle here. Skeptical. It's just hard work, you know? <laughs> uh, anyway. <laughs> you see Daniel approaching with a, with a glass of water tomorrow, Francois. Absolutely. You know yeah. what, you know I'm pretty sure doing. I see him at a village with different brand every morning to try and test <laughs> you know, you different out. tastes. Yeah. Uh, have you, what about Highland Spring? Have you ever tried a little Highland Spring water? Must try that on you sometime. Well, no, I'll try this. Yeah, mm. I'm, I'm sure it's is it, is it as bad as contrast. It's than any of this French water. <laughs> um, listen, just finally on today's stage, in the any other business column, although really it deserves to be more prominent than that, the third place of Guillaume Martin, the young French writer on Wanted Group Goubert, who featured in our Kilometer Zero the other day, Breakaway Kings. Ironically, he's the one rider on the team who has been told by his team director, Ilya van der Schuren, not to go and break away. He's desperate. Today especially, he was desperate to go in the break. Uh, it was our colleague, Clément Guillou, who tipped me off about this, actually. A bit, bit of tension in the team because he's desperate to go and break. Um, van der Schuren is holding him back. I spoke to van der Schuren at the finish, and he said, yeah, no, his advice to Martin is to follow through him, follow through him. Today, he said that four kilometers ago, he gave him the, the, the green light to have a go. He had a go, and... He was he was best of the rest, you know. Mm. Look at the guys he beat. Uh, a phenomenal performance by him, and it's it's interesting because it's almost like Van der Schuren wants him just to learn at this tour and, and rates him very highly, but doesn't rate him highly enough to think that he can go and win a stage. Another uh, French talent. I mean, he's getting a little bit. Uh, how could I say? Uh, well, not annoying, but I mean, you know, we, we've been so uh, deprived of talent for, for many years, and now they, they come from all over the place. Um, Daniel, in his uh, in his little uh, intervention, uh, intervention, yeah, I, I like I like to to call it like that, you know. Uh, well, he intervened in our you know friendly conversation with uh, you know making uh, uh, you causing know, trouble, posing, yeah, causing trouble, posing. Qu- questions and uh, he, he was asking himself what what is going uh, Lilian Calmejan is going to be like is, is he going to be a GC rider what type of rider actually Dominique Arnaud the uh, direct, direct energy team director had a, had a reply to that and an answer he said he reminds me of Thomas Vockler when he was young so maybe we could expect the same kind of rider who can win some classics win grand tour stages maybe one day or another have a go at a gc if you know the circumstances uh, are good but um yeah I, I suspect that's the kind of rider we can expect him to become well listen it's been been a long one tonight i think we brought you some action from the mountain but we should wrap things up and get ourselves off the mountain we should well we haven't got far to go we're staying about a kilometer from here which is lovely actually lionel yeah, no. it, it is yeah. longer oh, than it sorry seemed. Sorry about yeah. that. Oh, <laughs> we better get a move on then. I know, <laughs> I know uh, Francois there with Daniel's intervention looking nervously towards the bench to make sure his place in the team is secure. I can <laughs> confirm that. You're, and by you're the way, <laughs> just to clear up, for those of you uh, not familiar with Daniel's Justin Rose story, he, he once beat him at cycling. I think that's the story, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> I know. He once beat him in a, guy, a junior golf tournament. Yeah, they're both saying, right? Yeah, he's never no, he's stopped. Old, I, know he's, I know the first thing he's going to do tomorrow is say, Correct me on that. So I think he was a teenager. Well, that's junior, isn't it? Justin he? Rose is the oh. Olympic champion, isn't he? Yeah. He is. He is quite good at golf. He's Daniel, to be golf. fair, Daniel is good at golf, um, but not quite professionally good at golf. No. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> good to clear that one up, and let's leave it there. We'll be back tomorrow, uh, Sunday. Another good stage in prospect. Lionel, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francois. Thank you, Richard.